Yes, I emailed Andrea yesterday and I said, well, this is harder than I thought it was going to be, which is often the case with house research. But when I was working here, one of the things that I used to think about was how all these people seem to sort of live near one another. There were a lot of basket makers who I had been told lived, you know, up by five corners. And so I guess a larger project that I wasn't able to accomplish this time would be I'd love to see a map of where the basket makers' homes are and, and maybe like, you know, if, if somebody was, if X was living next to Y, is that why their baskets look sort of similar? Were they sharing materials? Maybe that's something that could be like a larger thing that you could look at on like a GIS overlay. You know, could we see like, okay, people who lived in, people who were basket makers or people who were painters or anyway. So that's the seed that was in my head when I was thinking about all this. And so we're going to look at three houses and the histories of three houses, the people that live there. And I'll start talking you through how we did the research. Um, and then a couple tips for doing research about house house research. So the Preservation Trust is an organization that's been around since 1997. Uh, and just let me know if I need to speak louder. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nonprofit membership based organization that is concerned with preserving the arch architectural heritage of Nantucket Island. Um, all of the island is a National Historic Landmark, including Tuckernuck and Muskegon. And as you probably know, if you're a homeowner or you've just been around for a while, Nantucket, um, Nantucket's historic core was was well actually our okay so our historic district the nantucket historic district um and the hdc the historic district commission they were maybe the they were the second in the state uh right after beacon hill in boston so there's a lot of they're an architectural review board they're really concerned with the exterior of the house whether it's you know changing the color of the door or demolishing a whole house or building a new house that all has to go through the hdc Sure, sure. And we're sort of, we're, we're concerned in looking at um, not just the exteriors of houses, but the interiors, doing a lot. We do a lot of house histories. That's a lot of what I do at work. Um, and advocacy work, we're now involved with some of the work that the DPW is planning to do with the sidewalks on Upper Main Street. So that's a little bit about the Nantucket Preservation Trust. Um, me, that's not me, that's me in a historical moment, I guess. I just, I love that picture. So I work at the MPT. I'm also the secretary of the Nantucket Historical Commission, which is a new, well, it was a board that was dormant and has now been revived. So that's with the town, we're doing more like historic preservation planning. I'm the chair of the book festival. So if you have any books that you've read and loved, please tell me afterwards. And you may have heard me in better voice, my voice, I feel like I'm getting a little cold on WCAI, so that's me. So, um, okay, the first house that I wanted, and you wanted to look at was, well, how did I figure out where the basket makers were without going through like every house on Nantucket? And then I went through some of the um, biographies that the museum has on the website. I remember when, when Andrea and I had been writing some of them and Mary Ann Wasik and I before that, um, finding out where somebody lived and including that in the bio, or sometimes it said it on the label, the basket that they made, right? So Five Mill Street was one where we had already had a history done. So that was a good place to start. And this is Mitchie Ray's house. And this is one of the, so if you've, if you've seen these plaques around how the town, I know at least one of you has one on your home. Um, sort of lets passerbys know who lived there, the year it was built, or the first family to occupy it. It usually lets you know that we have a file, we have more information on, on that property back at the office. We're at 11 Center Street, by the way. So we had done a brief history of Five Mill Street where Mitchie Ray lived, and there was already all of the titles there, so I could just tell you who lived there. But the thing that I like about this house, Five Mill Street, is not only did Mitchie Ray, the basket maker, live there, but if you look through, I don't know if you can see this, but Eleanor Ham, who was Jose Reyes' sister-in-law, lived there. And she was a great supporter of Aletha Macy's as well. And uh, her mother lived there, uh, Adeline Ham. So that was Betty Ray, Betty Ham Reyes' mother. So Betty, Jose's wife, would have been in that house as well. So of all the houses on Nantucket, you have one where two big basket making, or three basket and craft making families all sort of converged there. Um, so the house was built uh, probably around 1801, soon after Charles Folger, a boat builder, had purchased the land, uh, vacant land, and built the house. 
He left the house to his daughter, Phoebe. A lot of people have, well, I'll get to that later, about names and Nantucket history and how difficult that can be. Uh, Phoebe's sister, Clarissa, married Charles B. Ray, also a basket maker. Uh, and then her, so Clarissa died, Phoebe moved in with Charles B. Ray and they sort of formed this new family unit living together. And then the possession, when she died, possession passed from the Folger to the Ray family. And then Mitchie Ray ended up uh, buying the house, acquiring it from his other family members in 1911. So he sold the house in 1923, wasn't there all that long, but he did, oh, sorry, I didn't proofread that. I should say on. Uh, he kept his basket making studio on nearby Starbuck Court. So I just love those pictures of Mitchie Ray. And we've got a couple other pictures of the house and of Mitchie Ray here. Actually, to pass around these histories because I have so many of them, but I do need them back. Um, little. Oh, so these are kept at the Nantucket Preservation Trust at 11 Center Street. And that's one of the other reasons why I really wanted to come and talk to you today because we do this, so what happens is somebody, they, they, a homeowner pays to have me do this history, this research, and then we have these files made or these little, this is a brief history. We have a, what is this, a house, I don't know, concise history. And then, this, then we have our bigger history. So we have three kinds of house histories that are done. There's two copies that we give to the NHA Research Library and two copies that go to the Athenaeum. And then we have files and copies of everything back at HQ. So if you ever see a marker on a house and want to know more about that house, you can always email me or call me. Or if you don't see a marker, we might still have a file. Um, we have well, histories, not on every house, but on a good number of houses. Um, and one of the other things that we've done recently, and hopefully it has to be done by the end of the year, excuse me, <clears throat> is that the, um, we work closely with the Preservation Institute Nantucket, which is with the University of Florida. I think people are surprised to find, I know I was, I kept seeing all these Florida gator, people wearing a lot of gators apparel, and I couldn't figure out why there were gators up here. But the University of Florida has been on Nantucket for 50 years doing preservation work. Um, and, and Walter Beinecke was involved, bought the, build, bought the building that we're now in. We rent space, MPT rent space from Florida now which is great to have this close partnership with them. Anyway, they're the young kids you may have seen walking around with these big camera type things. They do, they're doing laser scanning of the entire downtown uh, and they're doing laser scanning of some individual homes too, which is a really great thing for insurance purposes because it scans everything inside your house. So if you have a special fireplace or if you have special molding, you could recreate that from the 3D scans. It's the same technology that they're using to rebuild the Notre Dame Cathedral. That was 3D scanned. So we're slowly working with the town and with Penn to scan important buildings. Um, and anyway, we will have, we have also done an interior survey where we know there's 800 pre-Civil War era houses on the island. But what we didn't really know was how many of them were still intact. How many of them, so this this would be one of them, but this is a house that, that I would, we would rate a, on a scale of zero, one being the best, zero being the worst. This one I think is tech, is a three, the house we're in right now, because there are still some elements, like especially up on the second floor, there are some elements of the original design of the house, but since it's been opened up, we sort of lost that layout. Uh, but anyway, we have done, we've collect, compiled this big database where we're going into houses or looking at HGC records or looking at real estate uh, listings to try to figure out how many of those structures still have their original floor plan or their plaster walls or things like that. And so about 200 of them are in you know, that pristine condition. 200 are in, they're like, they're basically shells of houses. And the rest are somewhere in the middle where they might have a fireplace or they might have the front foyer, or they might have you know, some, some of the original molding. So that will eventually, Florida is working on that. By the end of the, it's a moving target whenever I just realized, remembered I was being filmed. <laughs> uh, 
But anyway, by the, I'm hoping by the end of the year, uh, if not early next year, it will be on a GIS map where you will be able to, you see a house, you could click on it and it will tell you so this whole file will be online is what I'm trying to come back around to the question of is we have all this really great information, but I don't think a lot of people know that it's accessible and, and easily readily accessible. I just have to go and pull out a file, but I will be automated and it will be a GIS map soon. So that's really exciting. Um, and then again, going, just going back a little bit up, back up to five mill street where we've got, um, we, we encounter a couple decades later, the hams by the house in 1957. <coughs> and that is 1957 is right around the time that Reyes bought the house over on York street as well. So that was kind of interesting too. <clears throat> and Mary, um, so Mary Elizabeth Betty Ham, everybody remember the Betty basket that's at the museum? It's the really big round one here. That was owned by Reyes's wife, Betty. And it was her sister, Eleanor Ham, who ended up buying the house from their mother and living there. And she was a great friend of Aletha Macy's. They owned a racehorse together. Is that right, Andrea? <coughs> yeah, yeah. And most of the items that you had in the museum last year or two years ago that belonged to Aletha Macy or were made by Aletha Macy belonged to Eleanor Ham. So it just seems sort of strangely serendipitous. And may, I don't know, maybe they threw the basket maker network, knew this was a good house to buy. I don't know. So that's the house relatively recently, but built in 1801. The next house I just wanted to talk about is a, a little bit more of, a, it's not as straightforward of a story as trying to trace through all the deeds. That's for Pine Street where Frederick Chadwick lived. And I remember when I was doing research on Chadwick a number of years ago, seeing that he had bought this house with his siblings in 1874 when they were all teenagers and trying to wonder why they had done that and what had happened in the family. And I still haven't been able to answer that question. And in fact, Jim uh, Sulzer, who was a teacher up at the school and a writer, uh, he had written an article for Historic Nantucket that I'll show you a picture of that was all about this house. And, Trying to, he had reshingled the house and wanted to do a history of the house, and it was a really interesting read of his journey through the deeds. And we had the same questions: and why could they not be <laughs> figured out? So, anyway, Chadwick, um, Frederick Chadwick, who was a basket maker, who um, was born in the 1850s, he was the um, I'm trying to remember now. He was the he was a firefighter and he had been an attendant at the um, asylum at one point in time, you know, when it was the, for, I guess, a poor house. And he was also the um, Commodore, or not the Commodore, but he was the attendant at the New York Yacht Club station, Nantucket. So he was a guy who had a lot of different jobs on Nantucket and lived in this house on Four Pine Street for a good part of his life. His daughter ended up uh, inheriting the house and then his that family owned it until the 70s. Those are two pictures from the website. And I took that picture of the basket, so I was so glad that it was still there. <laughs> because as Andrea can tell you, taking pictures of baskets is perhaps one of the hardest skills to try to get the camera to focus everything in. Um, so I started doing, before I came across this article that Jim Schultzer had already written about how hard it was to research this house, I started doing my own research on it. And it started off, and I'll talk about how do you do that in the next slide, it started off relatively easily, but then it started, it got very tangled up in the mid 1900s. By the 1940s, it was already, so somebody owned one third of the house and somebody owned two thirds of the house. So there are a couple of places you can go uh, when if you're looking in the registry of deeds, you start to get confused. Usually a deed, and you all will talk about this more in the next house, more of a case study, but a deed will have, it'll say, you know, Mary Bergman bought this house from, I don't know, Lauren. And if you look back, <laughs> thanks Lauren. And if you look back at deed, you know, in book 43, page 123, that'll have Lauren's title. And then you go to that and it'll tell you who the person who owned the house before was. And you can follow back and back most of the time. It's usually once things are going really fast that things then stop working out. 
And then you can look at probate records, which are upstairs on the second floor of the town hall and look into wills. Because if you're not seeing the, the clues in the deeds, it might be in the will. If you are trying to figure out who these people are, um, you know, if you can see that somebody inherited a house from somebody else, it's always good to try to look at the Barney genealogical record that the NHA has to try to see how they're related. If somebody leaves somebody else a house, it's probably likely that they were related. Um, so in this, this example of the four Mills or the, the four Pine Street house, one of the things that Jim Sulzer pointed out when he was researching through these deeds was that it said that the Chadwicks had bought the house from a woman named Susan Mitchell, and there were like two or three Susan Mitchells living at the time. So how did you, he ended up eventually, Libby Oldham now solved the problem, and that's a resource you can't go to anymore. Libby was really, really a genius at the NHA. And she found a deed by looking at you can look at the neighbors to try to figure out who owned. Sometimes the neighboring deed will reference the house that you're looking for. So anyway, it's likely that this Pine Street, I, I, if you look up the article, Susan Mitchell, a woman of many identities in the historic Nantucket um, magazine, that's a really good rundown of sort of like the worst case scenario problems you can encounter when you're trying to research a house and what are some ways that you can dig yourself out of it. So here's a house that I did the research for from start to finish so I could sort of show you how, how you go through it. 97 Orange Street, Ferdinand Silvaro, another basket maker that's been featured here at the museum. And it's 93, 95, 97. So the one closest to us. So it started out normal. I was looking on, I'll show you online, you, the, most of our deeds are digitized until a, about book 100, I think, is all online. The rest is actually in the registry of deeds at the town hall. And there's this, you know, chain where it just kept telling me to go back and back and back. And I see Aletha Macy, I, Althea Macy Silvara, not Aletha Macy. That is, of course, the other confusing naming thing in the basket world. Aletha, Althea Macy Silvara, who was uh, Silvara's wife, had sold this house to the Old People's Home Association. So then I thought, okay, well, where did she get the house from? Well, it said that in the deed, it said that she'd received the house from the will of Phoebe Ann Vincent. And then nothing. So I thought, okay, I, I don't know who Phoebe Ann Vincent is, and I had to figure that out. So I went to the NHA's archives online, and I looked at the Barney genealogical record, and I searched Barnard, or searched Vincent. <clears throat> and that brought me to Phoebe Ann Barnard, because you click on it and, it, and then it pops up her maiden name. So I was, I usually click around on the, okay, let's see the, different family relations to see if I can find Silvaro or Macy or anything like that. So I kept clicking through and then I see, okay, this daughter, we'll click, click Ellen Vincent. And Ellen Vincent had a daughter, Althea Macy. So that would be the grandmother, the woman before who willed the house was the grandmother. So that was good. And yep, there she is. Althea Macy Silvaro. So that's interesting because a lot of times when you're searching through deeds, you might think, well, let me look if, at the father's side, or let me, let me look for the deed that belongs to Vincent's father. But the land was not always coming through in the father's side. And in this case of this house, almost all the land passed through the women's sides of the family, which is interesting. So it's Silvaro's house. It was Ferdinand Silvaro's house, and it's written about as such in the photos of the NHA. But he didn't actually ever own title. He didn't hold title to the house at all. It was always his wife who held the title. But she actually received the title to the house after he had died. But we know that her grandmother died in 1900, and they were living in the house till 1953. So we can assume they were living there right after the grandmother died, even though the estate hadn't took a long time to be settled. So 
So now I figured out that front part of how are the Silvaros attached. I still didn't really know who Phoebe Ann Vincent or Phoebe Ann Barnard Vincent was and how did she end up in this Orange Street house. So down at the Registry of Deeds at the town hall, has anybody been in the Registry of Deeds? Oh, it's like one of my favorite places to be. It really is because when you're looking at a computer all day to actually be down and picking up these heavy books that people in the past wrote in and you have to know you're cursive and you have to, I don't know how kids in the future are ever gonna work for law firms and do title searches because it's hard. Thank God the people in the past had better handwriting than I do. Um, so there's all of these you can look up. A lot of stuff is online, digitized, like I said, but there's these big indexes for every year from basically when the proprietors came to Nantucket to now. So if you don't know the exact book and page where the deed that you're looking for is recorded, you can pull out what's called a grantee grantor index. So the grantee is the person who's buying the house. So I looked through, so first I looked at Joseph Vincent because he was who I assumed bought the land, the wife, the husband, excuse me, of that Phoebe Ann Barnard Vincent. And I had to figure out when did he live and die so that I sort of narrowed down the window of what I was looking for. Um, so then I, you just look through the index. And thankfully, if you're looking for somebody whose last name is Vincent, you're gonna look through the index very quickly. When I come through, when I'm going through the deeds and I find somebody, if I'm looking for a coffin, it takes three times as long, <laughs> or, or a Macy, or any of those old Nantucket names. There, there are quite a few of them. So I kept seeing Vincent's name a lot, and I thought, well, that was strange. It's, you know, there are the people that you start to know as land developers, as people who bought up a lot of land and built houses and sold them, and I, I didn't really know who this Vincent guy was. But the, so I started just looking up the various deeds that were re referenced him. And I saw all these plants, drawings of houses. And what they were was they were not actually deeds, but they were agreements between Vincent and the homeowner that he was gonna build them this house. So he was a house right. So he was somebody who built a number of houses on the island, which is always exciting to find who was out here working at the time. So I thought, well, I wonder if he built this 97 Orange Street. Uh, so I kept searching and searching and searching. <coughs> and I finally found a transaction between a Barnard, who was the wife's family, and Vincent. So I figured this must be the deed. And indeed, it was. But it referenced this house so Vincent was buying up different pieces of land from the family, and it referenced the original deed, which I found here. And this was the house at 97 Orange Street circled there, and it actually says that the house was on the lot at the time, and it, all of the siblings owned it. And next to it was a store that was then taken down. So if you walk by 97 Orange Street, the house, on the corner of Orange and is it Warren? It looks so different from the other house uh, on the other side on uh, New and Orange, and that's because that house on the corner that we're talking about, 97, was built probably 1790, and the other house was built 1840. So it's more of a Greek revival house because they had taken down the house next to it. So those three houses that we saw in the first picture, two of them aren't there anymore. People were developing their properties all the time. Uh, well, after they had some money after the end of the whaling industry, but people were adding on, changing things. So there's a lot of times you'll find there may have been a house on a site for 200 years, but it might not have been the house that's, that's there now. So anyway, we got about all the way back on that 97 Orange Street house to 1790. Um, that's when I would assume that the house was built. Like I said, I would probably go back another deed just to double check there wasn't a house on the lot. One of the ways you can sort of figure out approximately when a house was built, if somebody buys an empty lot in the one deed and then the next deed there's a house on it, is you can look at their life. And if they had, they got married around a certain time or they had children around a certain time, 
That's oftentimes when a house was built, people would, I wonder how people, how that's gonna work in the future when you're trying to figure out these deed searches, because if you were look, you know, that, that's not true for me. I didn't get married or have children when I bought a house. So, but everything's digitized now, so it'll all be keyword searches. So that's the house. And I also just wanted to show you a couple of these resources that I've been talking about. One of the best places to start if you are trying to figure out how old the house is, is the Architecture of Historic Nantucket by Clay Lancaster. It's, it's not everything in it is 100% is accurate, but it's a good place to sort of get an idea of if just, it's a good, in the back, there's a listing, street list almost, of every, almost every street and house is on it, and that will let you, I don't know if you want to take a look, narrow down what you're looking at. And then the next place you really want to go, <coughs> oh yeah, that's, is the assessor database. Did I? Oh, sorry. Oh, did it fall asleep? Uh oh. Help me. No signal. So weird. Yeah. Okay, this is beyond my. Here we go. So. On the Town of Nantucket website, you can start at the Assessor's Database. Let's just do 49 Union Street, because that's where we are. And you can see, this starts to give you the first couple of, of deeds. <clears throat> and usually the first two or three, in this case four, are listed online. So then 138, 140, 138, 140. Somebody can remember that. Then the registry of deeds is online as well. Masslandrecords.com slash Nantucket. And now that you have that, that, that last deed, 138, 140, you go to search criteria book search, book 138, page 140. Now this gets a little more confusing if something is in land court, the regist recorded land versus registered land. Anyway, that pulls up. I know I did the history of this place at one point in time. So there's that 49 Union Street deed, and it says, being the same premises conveyed, blah, 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 recorded in Nantucket Registry of Deeds, book 114 to page 360. So you would just keep going back. You go to page 114, or book 114, page 360, and keep going. As, and you could go back maybe two more deeds online before you probably have to go downtown because it hasn't been completely digitized yet. But like I said, that's the fun part. Getting down there and really getting your hands on some um, primary research. And then the other great resource out here, it's not great that it pulls up the Polyters report as the first, first thing for 49 Union Street. That's not when the museum owned the building. But you could type in 49 Union Street or the family that you found at the Nantucket Athenaeum, they have the INM archives digitized back to about 1820. So that's helpful because you can find obituaries, you can find, you will find a lot of police reports depending on who lived in your house. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's too far back. There we go. Okay, so that's 1917. We can see the names of some of the people who were living here at 49 Union Street. One day when I have some free time, haha, ha, we'll sit back and actually figure out if this house really was built in 1821 as the sign above the door declares, because I could only get back to 1844 in the deeds, but that was, that was a few years ago. Uh, and then this, so this is a great resource. It's, it's a keyword search, but it was transcribed, I think by humans and by robots. So it's not, 
as anybody who's looked in here could tell you, it's not a perfect search. You, you might want to try a couple different keywords and you can also browse by narrowing down the time because if, if the person who transcribed that page that you're looking at spelled the name wrong that you're typing in, it's not going to pull it up no matter. So try different spellings on names too. Here's a gr another great thing about Nantucket. If there was someone else born at the same time as me, like say Mary Bergman was born in 1987 and then there was another Mary Bergman born in 1988, that Mary Bergman would call themselves Mary Bergman II, even if we weren't related. Mm -hmm. So that's a convention in Nantucket naming that I have come across is where there's people that were not related and they're the second. So the second is different than junior. That just means there was another Tom Smith living at the same time. So you will start to see a lot of the same names um, and that, that's just something to keep in mind. But yeah, so the Barney genealogical record is the other, the other big thing that I use a lot that I'd recommend to you. And that's on the Nantucket Historical Association's website. You can look for last names. So we, let's look up Chadwick just so. My search is not that great on here. Oh good, I remember it. So yeah, so there's that Chadwick that we were talking about before. And you can click and it'll tell you who their family, their father was, their mother was, who all their relatives were and back and back and back. So you can really do a lot of research online. If a house has one of those medallions on it, the metal markers from the NHA, there might be some history about that house at the Historical Association archives, but I will tell you that those markers, for a long time, the research was, or the, the, it was on the onus of the owner to prove their house was historic. And there's one house, and I'm sure there are others, where I thought, oh, there's a marker on it. There'll be a whole file there. And I went up and there was one note card that said, I'd always been told this house was built in 1745. And they were like, okay, check. Now you can put a plaque up. We're a little stricter at the trust where we have to go back through the deeds. And sometimes people get upset if the house, they thought the house was built in 1774, or 1772, and it was really 1780. But there are some pre-revolutionary war houses out there still around. So it's an exciting thing to find to look through house history. Um, and um, you could do it yourself. We could do it all for you. There could be a combination of the two. I'll tell you in the winter time, if you do have questions about a house history, it's usually slow enough that I'm happy to do a little bit of preliminary research to tell you, I think this is gonna be an easy project, a hard project. I think this is something you could probably do or not. So that's, uh, I think, yeah, that's really it. It's, um, it's a lot of fun and it's really exciting to see how many different things you can learn just from a deed. It tells you a lot about the people who live there. There's a house over at Three Beaver Street I'm researching right now where the husband went to the West Indies and died in 1784. And when the wife sold the house, she kept her dowager's estate where she actually lived in the house for the next two families that lived there. She lived in one, one part of that house. And this is a house from the outside, Three Beaver. They're working on it now. You would never guess that it was built in the seven, probably 1760s because so much has changed to the, they moved the windows around in the 1940s, but it was up in the attic and it you know, has were some, some old timey graffiti. So that's the other thing to look for. Are there are little marks or things inside your house. So thanks for letting me talk about houses and through the lens of basket making. Um, does anybody have any questions or, or any projects you're working on you need some thoughts with? Yeah, please. Um, well, living next door at um, 47 Union, um, I had the misfortune of having a, a new neighbor come in and um, assert that my boundary Mm. Um, especially as the, the land value changes, this, um, it can be quite uh, rapacious and pr predatory. But I had to do as much research as I possibly could to establish 
what was going on. And the, one of the most interesting things is that in the 19th century, which is the, the late 19th century, which is the dark ages for Nantucket, because um, there was no po virtually no population. They had all fled after the decline of the oil and, um, and the gold rush. Um, they um, didn't have any money. So all sorts of transactions occur mm. um, between people by um, oh, bartering and uh, uh, verbal arrangements and things that are very hard to, to find in, in the recording. But the other thing that happens is that, which is why Nantucket is really interesting for me, um, is that so much of this is in the hands of women. Yes. A far greater proportion is in the hands of women here than it ever before. And it's quite understandable because um, men went off to sea, got lost, and the women were left holding the... the holding them, yeah. And, you know, you talked about a dowager's estate. There's very... Women were constantly thinking in terms of how to preserve the... Um, roof over the heads of their families. Yes. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, teenagers could end up um, owning a house together because yeah. um, they needed um, some, some kind of security um, and uh, maybe an elderly parent or grandparents, you know, someone yeah. wanted to make certain that it, it, uh, they had a roof. Um, but even more interesting is that the women um, had, um, they took on roles that um, are normally associated with men. Meanwhile, on the mainland, um, they weren't um, allowed to be holding property in right. some places. Yeah, one of the things that we see that's really interesting is that so a number of the houses on Upper Main Street those families also owned houses on Main Street in Sconset, and those were their summer houses. So I know there are some of you who summer in Sconset and winter in town, at least one. Um, that, that's a fashionable, that, that, that was happening, you know, back in the 1820s. And interestingly enough, the wi women were the ones who owned most, a lot of time the women owned the Sconset property in their own name. Um, but, but you do see a lot, you're right, you see a lot of women owning property on the island all throughout history. Um, and I think that Jason Finger's book about Nantucket women, The Daring Daughters of Nantucket, is a really great read and helps contextualize that where her argument is basically Nantucket was one of the last frontiers and that that's why, um, you know, women can, but to your point about just the necessity of the men being gone, you know, I think she says women outnumbered men four to one at certain points during the whaling industry, people who were on land. So they were, they were making they were doing the sales and making the money. Yeah, even worse. Most of the early deeds all include head-offs. A husband could not sell the land without his wife's approval. That's right. Because he often wasn't there. And so, the, yeah. in fact, it may have been in his name, right. but the ed ox, which was in our deeds, yeah. uh, and those go back to the late uh, 18th century. Most of your, uh, yeah. And the other thing was, many of the houses, if not most of them, were sold with the life right. In other words, the person, the elderly person who lived in that house sold that house with the proviso that they could stay there even if it was in one room somewhere uh, for the rest of their life. So that, that uh, it's, follows yes, you yes, all these Yes, yes, you do, you do see the wife's, if the wife is, a lot of times the wife is listed uh, as the grantee with the husband, but you're right, she also is signing the deed to, or the reference to my wife will be there. I know that my uncle is worried about his, what his children are going to do with this house, so he's been talking about a life estate, so maybe that will <laughs> come back in popularity. <laughs> yeah. So if her husband didn't return, she had to be able to negotiate legally. You're absolutely right, yeah. It was, um, that happened yeah, very it did, it did. They, I mean, I think the, the, the takeaway that I get in looking at the work that I do is that the people of Nantucket were so resilient and continue to be so. Um, and we can think about all the challenges that are faced today. I think that's one of the things that really is powerful to me about thinking about historic houses is you're in a building where 
somebody really, they were there and they wondered, was their husband gonna come home from sea? And, or was their son gonna come home from war? Uh, just all of these experiences that we, you know, as humans, the, the, the hope that we have, the loss that we feel, the people that came before us felt those things too. And uh, that's very helpful to me as I look around the world today that I am very scared of. <laughs> I think, okay, you know, these houses made it through these storms and so we'll make it through whatever the next one is. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am gonna go down to Brant Point tomorrow with my camera, that's for sure. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah, any other questions or thoughts? Or I'll hang out if anybody has any one-on-one -on -one thoughts. Well, I, when I bought my house at 10 New Street in mm -hmm. 1971, I looked it up and it was built in 1836. And then the husband died and the woman had it with several children and she remarried and she died in around 1863 or so and divided up the land so that the front part on New Street with the house went to her children and the back part went with just the land to her second husband and that was on Back Street. And he sold it to one person, but the way he did it, he sold the land with the house that the children owned for let's say $50 and the empty land that he owned for $300 so he cheated the children. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. very clear yeah. from just seeing the transaction yeah. so that, that he ripped them off. Yeah, yeah. So you can infer a lot about those relationships just from that the paper. Yeah. So I have a couple of the little books. Actually, they're all Sagonset books that I brought today. If you want to take a look. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming by. Let me bore you.